Welcome everybody. I'm Sarah Krotz. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the director of the Canadian Literature Centre at the University of Alberta on Treaty 6 territory and Region 4 of the Métis Nation of Alberta. This has been a gathering place for diverse Indigenous nations for thousands of years. And I'm grateful today that we can gather in this virtual space. Um, so thank you all very much for, for joining us. Today's reading is brought to you in partnership with the Writer in Residence program at the Department of English and Film Studies. Here to introduce this year's Writer in Residence, Ifoma Chinuba, is one of our PhD students and an accomplished writer in her own right, Jamoke Verissimo. Jamoke is the author of two award winning poetry collections, I Am Memory and A Birth of Illusion. Her most recent work, A Small Silence, was awarded the Edu Snyder Prize and nominated the Andache Prize in 2020. Her poems and novel have been translated into many languages, including Italian, French, Portuguese, Norwegian, Spanish, and Japanese. And her latest work is a children's book, A Duque and the Secret in the Moon, published in 2021. So welcome, Jamoke and Ifoma. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Sarah. I would once again like to thank everyone for joining us for this edition of the CLC Writer in Residence Brown Bag Lunch Reading. Um, I'm very happy to be speaking with Ifoma Kimuba today, the award-winning author of five books, three novels, a collection of poetry and dialogue, and a juvenile novella. I got the opportunity to read some of Ifoma's novel as um, a journalist on the Guardian newspaper art desk in Nigeria, where I worked as a freelance journalist in the past. So we can say it's really fantastic to be here again in Canada too, talking to her. Ifoma was a former diplomat who, visited over, who has visited over 60 nations prior to settling in Canada. Before serving as a consul for Nigeria, in various parts of the world. She was forced to flee her homeland as a refugee during the Nigeria Biafra War of 1967 to 1970. The, the Biafra nation was carved out of Nigeria's Southeast area and attempted to secede, which led to the war. Perhaps many people may recall images of refugees that made their way into the world media introducing them to what American author Philip Goveridge called Africa's first televised war. Um, I'm interested in this because Ifoma is a former refugee and as a, re and as a research, researcher linked, conducting a research on the war, I'm familiar with the frailty and enduring pain of refugee lives. In addition, it's also important to note that Canada played a significant role in the war by providing humanitarian aid to war refugees. And for this reason, Ifoma's presence here in Canada as a writer in residence in the Department of English and Film Studies at the University of Alberta takes on a new meaning. She, a former ref refugee who became a diplomat and now living in a country that was part of her healing journey. Ifoma has moved beyond this nar narrative of her as a refugee into one who makes heart that witnesses others and their suffering. I'm delighted to speak with Ifoma today because she illustrates the different perspectives of what it's like to go through trauma and heal, either as somebody who was involved or as a witness. Today, again, I would re I'll repeat, we are going to be talking, I'm going to be talking to a former diplomat, a writer, our writer in residence here in the Department of English, University of Alberta effortlessly one of the leading Canadian universities. <laughs> um, using a wide travel experience, Ifoma has transformed travel into an art form of thoroughly investigating the societies in which she finds herself, paying particular attention to the sufferings that are camouflaged as news articles or fading mentions on our social media accounts. In our first novel, Mentions of Flesh, for instance, Ifoma depicts the experience of young girls 
trafficked to Italy for prostitution. While in a second novel, Fearless, he reevaluates the experience of being uprooted from home through the story of a Caucasian boy visiting a Nigerian village for the first time. In Waiting for Mar Maria, another novel, which was on the Commonwealth Writers' Prize long list, he focuses on women on death row. And for African romance, which is our only collection of poetry to date, she explores the experience of growing up in a polygamous household in Northern Nigeria. The book, which appears to be inspired by Okot Bitek's Song of Lawino and Song of Okot, focuses on what may be considered a very personal experience of the, char um, or, uh, the, char of char of the characters. In all those novels, in all those books, Ifoma's writing is, remains committed to sharing stories about the making and unmaking of the human. As a result, even in our most recent book, Be Ed Boy, written for a juvenile audience, the subject of two boys wanting to be Ed Boys in a primary school calls the ethics of electoral practices into question. In all of our writing, Ifoma continues to make a concerted effort to walk through a childhood trauma to shed light on the suffering of others. I'll begin by posing three questions about Canada, movement, and of course, the pandemics to Ifoma. If it's fine, I would also ask if you can read um, maybe your poems or a writing of yours along with the, your responses. So following that, and I would, after the questions, I would invite members of the audience to also ask and respond to their question. But now, I would also say thank you, Foma, for, for um, this opportunity and... Thank you for generous introduction of, my, of me and my, and my works. I'm happy to be in Edmonton to enjoy this weather. Thanks to the University of Alberta, Department of uh, English and Film Studies, who deemed me worthy to, worthy enough to be appointed their writer in residence for this 2021-2022 session. Thank you very much also to Sarah Kurtz and your, your colleagues at the CLC for also inviting me to be part of this uh, dialogue. Um, okay. I'm here, I'm at your, um, at your service, at your disposal, whatever you can ask me to get. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for that, Ifoma. So my first question, let's ask to do with Canada. So um, you've been to so many places, you've traveled to so many places. These travels come with personal meaning for you. I remember, one of the discussions we heard, we had you talk about the diverse beauty portrayed in Canada's landscape, you know? And um, for example, we could say Edmonton is a fascinating city, um, unpretentiously integrating nature and urbanity. I like to call it a city of surprises, like a city that leapt out of the, of the wood. And um, I'm thinking about, how you kind of bring this travels, you know, your travel experiences to this settling down in Canada, which gives you this diverse sense of travel in one place. How do you approach grounding yourself in Canada? How is your, ex how do you connect your experiences of travel to settling here in Canada? Well, First, you mentioned that I was a, a child refugee. At the age of seven or eight years, I was forced to flee from uh, First, before the even international flight, there was an internal displacement, moving from the city to the village, running away from the, the theater of war, you know, where it was hardest. And then the second movement was running away from Biafra then, out of the country, being ferreted away into a neighboring country, uh, Libreville, Gabon. And then from there, 
brother to Ireland as a refugee again. So I think that is where the, the travel bug bit me, very young. Um, and then there was culture shock, mind you, because when I left uh, the village for a French speaking country, I didn't even know there was another language. We are still battling with English, trying to understand the is and the was. And then here yeah, we were faced with, uh, with French, you know, so uh, travel, as you know, our people say that a traveler knows more than the gray haired person. A person who has traveled knows more than the person who has not moved from his, uh, you know, from his ancestral lands. So that uh, bug, that travel bug, I guess, beat me there. And also the interest in French to, to learn more about this language. And, um, and uh, you know, from there, Ireland, a new culture. If you, when I got to Ireland, I couldn't, even from the aircraft, as we are about to land, you know, with these the characters, the lady that was accompanying us, she gave us new clothes, you know, thick sweaters and hats and trousers. Ah, and we're saying, where are we going that we have to dress like this? What, we're, we're looking at each other, the refugees, you know, because in the village, we already had our, you wear your dress and from January to December, it's the same weather. You run out and you play. Here we are being given a, you know, stuff that looked like youth bags to wear. So that was a culture shock, you know, from the travel. Not to mention when we got to the school and people were touching our hair to see, did you put cotton on your hair? Why is your hair like that? And, you know, touching you. So many aspects of uh, meeting a new culture. We had the, not to talk about food. In our villages, we are eating what we call swallow. You know, we just dip it in a sauce. And you say, I hear they were giving us Irish potatoes and carrots and leaves and, and we say, what, what is this? So the culture shock was there. But after the war, I went back to Nigeria, now Nigeria, no longer Biafra, now Nigeria, and completed my education and uh, opted for the foreign service. You see, that travel book was, it had beaten me. And as a diplomat, I traveled all over the world, not just from foreign postings, you're posted to this country to work, but even at home, when you're not at post, you, you have to represent your country at international conferences, get sent to all over the world, anywhere, depending on your department. Uh, so that diplomacy, that career was a nomadic one, an itinerant one, you know, moving from one place to the other. So it enabled me to visit so many uh, countries. I didn't live in them. Some countries, two, three days, attend a conference and come out, you know, but if you had the time in the evenings, you went to the city center to, to gauge the DNA of the, of the town, of the city, of the, of the country. Let me digress here to say that travel, travel is an important part of a writer's uh, uh, life because you get, to, you get to learn more. But that is physical travel. There's also the mental travel. Because as a writer, immediately uh, somebody gets your book. You transport him or her from his vicinity, from where he is. You move him out of uh, that environment. He may be in Edmonton, maybe he studied in Edmonton, uh, but uh, he opens your book and you're talking about Africa. And so you transport him from that environment to another place and the culture and uh, everything is, is part of the travel. Now, coming back to the physical travel and my experiences all over the world, and what similarities they have with Canada. Um, I must say, first I have driven from Edmonton to Jasper. So in the middle of the Rockies. And I think my mouth was agape throughout. I was saying, wow, what, what nature, what is this? How majestic, how huge, how, oh my God. I couldn't fathom it, I couldn't process it. But then I remember that I have seen Rockies, rock formations akin to the Rockies here in Alberta. In the Plateau State, Plateau State in Nigeria, even from the name, you can tell that it's on a high pedestal and it has a lot of rock formation, boulders, hard, hard rock, and all that. There is that kind of formation. So that coincidence is there. 
fire of nature. You also get this in, um, if you are flying, maybe the Swiss Alps, the French Alps, Italian Alps that are all together. You see, it's, it's the same thing. You see rocks, rocks, rocks together. So that um, semblance, that similarity is there. I also want to refer to the Victoria Falls that I also encountered in, a, in, a, in a Zambia and Zimbabwe. It's also the, the falls that straddles two countries. You know, I viewed the falls from the two, from the two countries too, Zambia, because they are neighboring. And then always the rainbow, always is drizzling and always the sun is coming out. And so the rainbow is perpetually there. So it's one of the most magnificent sites I've seen. But I also met it in, a, in Niagara Falls. So it also in Niagara Falls. Also these waterfalls that bestride two countries, you know, and the mist and the rainbows and everything. So there's a lot of coincidence of, um, of uh, landscapes. And I must um, also mention that we have waterfalls in Plato State too, you know. I think of the Kura Falls, I think of Asok Falls, and each time I think of Victoria Falls and Niagara Falls, I also remember the, the falls in, um, in Nigeria. Finally, in order not to belabor the issue, Saskatchewan River in Edmonton, I run through Edmonton. We have the Night River Niger too in, uh, in Nigeria that uh, crosses from so many countries, from the Futajelon Mountains, in Guinea, crosses so many countries and drops into the ocean, uh, Atlantic Ocean in Nigeria. And so when I, I walk along the Saskatchewan River, I, I also remember, it's not the same color, it's not the same, uh, you know, uh, character, you may say, but being a river that flows and that has meant a lot for, for the community here, also, it sets my mind back to River Niger. So there are these uh, similarities in landscape in Canada because Canada has Canada, as you said, very diverse. It uh, encompasses so many things, so many ideas, so many phenomena that we find in um, other areas. So now to conclude this first part, I like to read a poem. That I, I wrote. It's, uh, it's, the title is Oh Birds. At some point, I was in Plateau State as a, as a student. I underwent a, a course of study. And each morning, I would go jogging, go walking, and birds would be perching along the way, you know, accompanying me, you know, chirping, tweeting along the way. And every day, every morning, I told you in Nigeria, we have the same kind of weather from January to. December. So you could be doing the same activities, just wake up and you're out. And so I wrote this ode to birds. Oh, birds, if I could flap my wings the way you do all day long from east to west, up and down on hills and valleys, from branches to cables, how slim my arms would be too. If I could shrill and chirp, tweet and whistle from dawn to dusk, to sun and breeze, herds and flowers, how thrilled I would feel. And if I could pick at my foot here and there, grains are that, some ants and fruits along the way, no fat, no alcohol, how nimble and fit I would look. Then would I balance on one limb, strut on nature's runway like the egret, clad in white like a bride, copy the peacock, do the catwalk for all to see. Oh, birds, I could learn from the thrush, Pilates instructor to jet my neck this way and that, straight to my waist, straight to my waist again and again for a scratch, wiggle from side to side and wave my tail in circles. Oh, how chic I would look too. 
thank, thank you so much, uh, Ifoma, for connecting the grounding to nature in the response to the question. Um, and thank you for the poem as well. Um, my second question, I'll just go on to the, sec to the second question and it has to do with the pandemic. I think it would be impossible to <laughs> go on with this without having the question on the pandemic. So, um, of course, we are living in the midst of uncertainties, as we like to say, and it is altering the course of our lives. Um, some of the ways this alterations have occurred as is so ingrained in us that we are on a unaware of how much we have changed. Um, and we have also associated the sense of pandemic with, you know, the loss, sadly, uh, deaths, and which comes with the different mutations and names that we continue to hear in the news. So, um, but my interest when I think about the pandemic, especially for you as a writer, is what it means for you. What is the pandemic for you? Um, just when the pandemic began, uh, Diana, Diana Brand had written an article, Narrative Reckoning and the Calculus of Living and Dying on how nothing had changed. So I would want you to think about or tell us about what the pandemic is for you. And if by any chance you have a poem to accompany that, I'm sure we'd like to listen as well. Thank you, Jumoke. Thank you again. Actually, one of my projects as writer in residence here is the production of a chapbook entitled The Pandemic and Me. Because we, we are told that the pandemics happen every hundred years, every century. So most of us didn't live to see the last one. And I don't think we are alive to see the next one. So we're living in, a, in an epochal period that we need to capture for upcoming generations, for people informed. And so to let them know how this thing impacted on us. So as I said, there's a, a chart book that I'm producing. I should uh, say that entries will close on the 15th. I think that'll be Saturday on the 15th of January. So if you haven't written something, you can still submit something, nonfiction of how this pandemic is affecting you. Spoiler alert, the chapbook, we are going to dedicate the chapbook, I intend to dedicate the chapbook to the coronavirus itself. And so there's a poem that will, you know, be in front, part of the dedication, because this coronavirus, um, Dedicating the book to it, not out of love, not out of love. When I think of the coronavirus, what comes to me is uh, that concept of abiku in our cosmology, Nigerian cosmology. The, the evil child, evil spirit, that we call abiku in uh, Yoruba or Obanje in Igbo. This is um, a child that dies and comes back, is born, lives a week, two weeks, one year, dies, comes back, is born again, goes into the mother's stomach and is born again, tormenting the family. Of course, in our part of the world, growing up without science, we didn't understand that concept, that phenomenon. We didn't understand that it was um, a sickle cell anemia, that the child, that the father and the mother had the AS, AS uh, you know, genotype. And when they meet, they produce a child that is a sickler and that lives a while, has a crisis and dies. In my part of the world, we, we couldn't understand it. And so we call this an evil child. And to dissuade it from coming back and tormenting the family, they used to punish it, mark it, cut, lacerate his body. You know, they, they, we will know you when you don't come back. Don't come back. If you come back, we, we damage you. But the child used to come back because it was scientific. Another approach was to beg the child. Beg the child, don't punish it, don't, don't be cruel. Beg the child, please, you have punished your mother enough. Please, please, if you don't want to stay, go, don't come at all. Two Nigerian poets also wrote very well on Abiku, 
J.P. Clark that wrote, pleading with the Abiku not to come back to have pity on the mother. And Wale Shoinka, our Nobel laureate, who took the other stance, punish it, punish it. But the Abiku said, yes, whatever you do, I'll come back, I'll come and torment you. So this poem, come back to our pandemic. I see this pandemic as the evil child that goes and comes back. You call it COVID-19 because it, uh, it uh, emanated in uh, 2019, but it continued in 2020, 2021, 2022, we are still here. Oh, on all the things we have done, we have been jabbed first time, second time, we boosted, we have covered, we have done everything for you to go away. You don't want to go away. So you are this an evil child. And dedicating this poem, this chapbook to coronavirus is a plea for mercy. Pity us. Have mercy. Have mercy. We've been here for two, three years. How many? Have mercy. So that is um, the poem I'm going to read now. As I said, it's a dedication to the chat book we are going, I'm going to produce on the pandemic and me. And it says, dedicated to the coronavirus, not out of love, dear, but in deference to your power. Witness a crown atop your coconut head. You have shown your might, unleashed havoc on us taking lives, proliferated death. We have Scottish Fellowship, separated Nono from Bambino, exhausted our medicals, and snapped our medical systems in two. You, you, you unraveled economies, shuttered businesses, disrupted supply chains, stripped retail shelves naked, spiking inflation, we admit you are mighty. Now, please go away. Go to whence you came, go, go. You and your multiple personalities, your COVID cycles, boom and bust, every, go away. Leave us now, Cor, Rona, Vi, Ross, Dell, Omi, Ihu, whatever, go and latch the door behind you. That's Thank my, you. me and the pandemic and when the chat book is out, all the nuances, all the various aspects of how it impacted us will be in it. Thank you. Thank you once again, Ifoma, for sharing the poem on the pandemic with us as well. Um, I also sh should have mentioned that Ifoma's um, poems and writing, writing is very much influenced by the oral tradition of storytelling. And it's, it's very focused on immersing the reader or the audience in the experience. So um, thank you once again, Ifoma. You're welcome. Yeah. So to the very last question, and then we would ask the audience to join us in this conversation. Because what is a conversation when we are not sharing? <laughs> okay, so if I'm at this very last question, this third question that I would like to ask has to do with your writing as well. Um, we've talked about your travel experiences and how it has grounded you here in Canada. And you um, talked about nature being your point of connection, how you connect to a place, how you connected to Canada was through the, uh, the natural elements. And of course, you also have shared with us the project you're working on, which is the pandemic and me. Mm -hmm. And of course, your very kind um, uh, interaction with Corona, if I would put it like that. <laughs> <laughs> so we are, ple we, 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 we are pleading with you. So my question has to do with your writing, how um, your travel, your experience, your trauma, your childhood trauma um, influences your writing, you know, how they have influenced your writing. I would say that I, 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 I at least from reading your work, I have this sense of your genuine concern for how people treat one another. 
you are very concerned about that. So based on your experiences as, um, of course, you can bring in your travel, you can bring in your childhood trauma. How does this reflect in your work? Thank you again, okay. In, um, in Fairless, for instance, where a young Britisher is forced to travel to Nigeria with his father for work purposes, he was sickly. I transposed my experiences as a refugee into that young man. So instead of a young black girl encountering Ireland, Irish, the white, he's a, a white, a Caucasian boy now encountering a Nigerian village, black, foreign. So he's going there with his father. That's the difference. Well, I went as a refugee all alone, but this young man goes to Africa with his father. And so his father has established guardrails. Don't do that. Don't swing. Don't drink from the street. Don't eat. Don't come back here and eat every evening. Don't eat in people's houses. Don't. Because he's an adult, he has his prejudices. But the young man, the young boy is 10 years old. Says, what? I see my mates swimming and nothing happens to them. I see them drinking and nothing. I'm going to do it. And he does it. And he comes, when he comes home, his father says, oh, well, dinner is ready. And you know, I've eaten. Well, you ate? What? Where? So I transposed that experience into Ralph meeting Africa for the first time. But over and beyond, I wanted, as I said, to refer to that Conradian view of Africa as the heart of darkness and to debunk that statement that nothing good comes from Africa because it's wrong. Because here you have a boy sickly and gets to Africa and the weather gets him well. And not only that, he's even able to get a concoction for his mother who is ill in, in London, concoction that will heal her. So the narrative of nothing good can come out of Africa is challenged in fairness. In Merchants of Flesh, which, uh, as you said, talks about the uh, human trafficking of Nigerian girls in Italy. As I said, I was a consul there, and uh, I met these girls firsthand, you know, and, uh, and I said, I have to write you, I have to tell your story, my girls, my dears, I have to tell your story because we don't want people coming. We don't want people coming to face what you are facing here. It's, it's not human. It's not human. And so that, that story, Merchants of Flesh, is about that travel, my experience in Italy. But more than that, more than that, travel, immigration, refugee, people are in search of a better life. In, in Igbo too, we say that a frog does not hop about in the afternoon under the sun because it is amphibian, it likes the cool, you know. So when you see a frog hopping about in the afternoon, something is after its life. A snake about to swallow it. So you see it hopping frantically, you know, out in the afternoon. So when you see people moving, these mass movements, going to inflatable boats to cross the Mediterranean into Italy, Lampedusa, or people going to rafts, to cross from Dakar to, to Spain, some things after them, they're in pursuit of the better life. And that is what also happens in Merchants of Flesh because sometimes you have to go through the valley of the shadow of death. You have to go through the valley of death. You have to go through the lion's den in order to get to the promised land. And this is what happens in the Merchants of Flesh. They are trafficked. They experience the worst any human being could experience. But when they are freed, when a fate, when the other girl, another prostitute comes and says, what? What? You must do something. And, and so she frees them. And, they, uh, and so they, the hell that they used to live in becomes a kind of of heaven, it's not heaven. I mean, it's been through hell. I don't know if people go through hell too. Then it could maybe a purgatory. They, they have gone through purgatory and now they're in heaven. So travels leads to 
promised land sometimes. And that's what I have shown in um, Merchants of Flesh, the people moving from Africa into Italy, going through a horrible life, pernicious life, but then there's freedom at the end. And also in Fairless, where this young man goes from London with so many prejudices from his father, his father trying to transfer them to his head. And he says, no, 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 leave me. Let me make my own experiences of Africa. So that is how I have tried to capture the, the, the issues, the phenomena that uh, we encounter as we travel up and down, even in Canada here. Canada was recently voted the number one country to live in, but still is a multiracial society. Still there are pocket, there is a lot of work to be done for acceptance, for people to, to be able to thrive, to you know, be all they can be in that travel. I like to, if you don't mind, read a poem again that I wrote. Uh, this one is a, the title is a plateau. As I said, Plateau is a state in Nigeria. High up there, best climate, best weather. Half of all the expatriates in Nigeria at the time were found in Plateau State in Jos because of the weather. It was the best. Many expatriates were in Jos. The capital is Jos. And um, as I said earlier, if they produce, everything you produce in Canada here is produced in Plateau State. And everything that is produced in the tropics also produced in Plateau State. It had that duality, that, that everything. So people used to go there. And because of their fertile land, the people are farmers, they grow food. And because of the luscious everything, many settlers, many people came, many people migrated, traveled to Plateau, especially the cattle rearers. Transhumans, people who move, nomadic, that move from place to place to feed their cattle. There is already a conflict between a farmer growing vegetables, plants, food, and the cattle rearer bringing his cattle to, to eat of the plants. And so there was bloodletting, a ferocious war between the owners of the land, the indigents, and the settlers, people who came. Very bloody, very people were killed. And after that, when the owners of the land had secured their ancestral lands, driven away the, the others, is when I visited. After the, the struggle for resources, if I'm planting grass, uh, vegetable, and your animal is eating it, you cannot exist in peace. And not only that, there was rival, there were rival faiths. These people are Christians. You, you are maybe Muslims or another religion. We don't look at our women the same way. Women were, were, were a source of conflict because we don't want our women to go with you because you're not part of us. But you, you, are saying, you need a woman, what are you going to do? So because of these conflicts, plateau people became xenophobic. They did not welcome strangers and foreigners. And this is when I, visited Plateau State. And then I wrote this poem to Plateau. And I said, I come to you with joyful abandon. Why the cold shoulder? Why slink away? Why peep from the corners of boulders, hillocks, eaves, like a faithless lover? I came the door in Eden Grove. I see your fields are washed with colors. I sight the sunflower and daisies, lilies and veggies dancing in the sun and breeze. I inhale the jasmine, the grass freshly cut. And I hear the robin serenade the butterflies, hints of the warmth of your hearth. Why this coldness then, Plateau? I know you have been hurt in the past. Friends betrayed you. Wayfarers struck you with violence and spite. But cheat your sword, Plato. Dispose the dagger. Fling the knife away. Unclasp 
the AK, drop the machete. Come, come rather to me. Enter my embrace. Let me smother you with love and kindness, compassion, grace. Open, plateau, open, let me in. Unlock the gates. Do roll away the blinders. Let love in again, plateau. Let love in. For beneath love lurks life. Thank you so much for that poem. It's time to um, ask the audience to join us in this conversation. You can drop your questions or um, comments in the box. And of course, you're also, you can also raise your hands and join um, us by just telling us what you think or um, if there's a question that you, you would like to ask you from a, please do so. There are just so many kind notes of gratitude here for your your beautiful poetry readings, Ifoma. It's so wonderful to hear you read them. And and Jamoke, thank you so much for your questions. This was such a rich and wide-ranging discussion. Soul-searching poetry, as Caro says. So I see one question here from um, Luciana, who says, Hi, Ifoma. And, and she's curious as to how you insert different languages into your poems so seamlessly. Could you say something about this practice? Yeah, I'm bilingual, maybe even a polyglot, if you include my native languages, <laughs> Igbo. And uh, I studied French in the university and I lived in Italy, as I said, and I found that Italy and uh, French are so close that once you speak one, you can speak the other, understand the other. So there's it, Italian there. And then visits all over the world, you pick up the languages because we te they tell us in the foreign service school that language draws people to you. And so that was one of the first things we do when we get to a country, we pick up the main. And then as a writer, you infuse your writing with these things. Thank you, Luciana. I'm so compelled by the image of the child <laughs> and the pandemic. Um, and, uh, and you know, I think we all, you know, when you said close the door behind you, <laughs> it really resonated. Um, and I wonder, you know, if you have any thoughts about, you know, how we live with that child, <laughs> if they're not going to go away. Um, what, what, you know, what are the ways in which we can uh, kind of think through um, our interactions <laughs> with the child. <laughs> As I said, in our own case, this evil child, we didn't understand it. We didn't know the science. It's the same uh, worldview that killed twins, multiple births. In those days, if you had multiple births, you had to come out with two kids or three. You can go to the evil forest. We don't, we don't understand. They didn't understand. We didn't understand. Uh, multiple births, sickle cell anemia, albinism, even. You were born an albino. I said, Whoa, where from this? Where? You don't understand mentalism at all. So, what we have here with coronavirus is science. Now, in Nigeria, for instance, many African countries, before you marry, even in the US, as a black person, because it's a disease of the black, before you marry, they ask you, What's your husband's uh, genotype? What is your own genotype? If there is AS in it, you say, no, you can't marry because you're going to have this C-class as children. So science has explained things to us. Now in Nigeria, before we used to throw away twins and multiple births, now people are looking for multiple births so that they can go once and, and forget it. So for the coronavirus, I think what will help us is science. We are even lucky that science was able to get um, this vaccine. Which, has a, which is a game changer. It's a difference between so many deaths that happen and nowadays people get, a, is it a Omicron and they don't even need to be hospitalized. But in the 2020, oh my God, it was like, it was like death was stalking the land with a scythe just going up and down and striking. So I think we have to put our hope in, uh, in science. They are working hard around the clock. Government is helping fund the research so that we already see a difference in the fact that Omicron does not kill it. It's not as it's a vicious as, a, as a, its a relatives, Delta and all that. So 
We have to put our hope in, in science. And then we thank technology. We thank technology that has brought this Zoom to us. We were talking before we went public. We were saying, thank God for this Zoom. Cecily, see, I'm seeing your face now. Before, if it was in a, it was physical, you mask, I wouldn't. No, in Nigeria, we used to say that uh, this uh, uh, COVID is very bad because you see somebody owing you in the street and you're not recognizing him. He will just pass and you pass because he's all masked, you see. So the Zoom has also its uh, good side that we can see people, see their beautiful faces in Maryland. You know, each time we went out, everybody's mad. We don't even know who is who. So thank God for technology that allows us to meet and unmask and show our ourselves. There's another question from Michael Gillingham about the distribution of vaccines. Your thoughts about the way that they've been distributed or not among richer and poorer nations. So what's your perspective on, on that? I think my ideas, I subscribe to the idea of the South African president, Cyril Ramaphosa. He said, why don't you allow us to produce the vaccines ourselves now? We have funded, government has funded the research. Why do you still, why do we have to wait for you to produce, give your people first, and then any remainders you send to poor countries? Why don't you give us the, the secret so that Pari as you're producing for your people, we too, we are producing for ourselves and, and giving our, our people. So I subscribe to, to that view that these are critical times. This is not the time to, to think of profits, to think of uh, copyright or, you know, this because of travel, again, to Moke, because of this travel all over the place. People are moving a lot. That you can't even say, uh, this is my country, I protect my citizens. Because your citizens, the next day they are gonna go out and come back and others are gonna come in. So if you don't protect the person coming in to your country, you haven't protected anybody. So I think it is time to go beyond the, what the Yoruba people call Tiwa, Tiwa, my own, my own. This is my, this is my drug. This is my secret. This is, it's time to go beyond that. And say that when you say the world is a global village, it is a global village. There's nothing like a boundaries anymore. What happens here when they caught, when South Africa caught this um, Omicron variant? It was already in, a, in a Britain, it was already all over in Canada, you see. So um, the, the developed countries should release the secret how to produce these vaccines to countries that can, that have the capacity to do it, like South Africa have the capacity to produce and supply the sub-region. I don't actually have a question, but I want to show you something, Ifoma. Um, this is an image that was actually beaded with seed beads. And then the woman made a print and it's of COVID-19. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so I, I wanted to show you that. Her name is Ruth Cuthand. As I say, she seed beaded the image of the virus first, and then she made prints, and I bought this print from her. But it might be a nice book cover. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. But I'll put a mask on that uh, coronavirus. I'll put a mask. <laughs> I'll put a mask on the virus. <laughs> Thank you. That is amazing and sort of. <laughs> hauntingly beautiful too, hey? Yeah, I paid a lot for the frame, but I thought it just would be interesting for people to see. Amazing. Yeah. With beads. Yeah. And the imitations too, because I see it imitating them, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Captured. Yeah. Well, once again, um, the the collection the the chapbook that ifoma is is working on that is open to submissions um is uh, i posted a little note about it in the chat so if you are a writer 
and you are thinking about the pandemic, <laughs> who isn't these days, um, please submit something. So her, her email address is, is there. Um, I also wanted to mention too that um, our next CLC reading features Jamoke Verissimo, um, along with um, Cornel Bogle and Uche Umezurike. Um, so in a, a, a dynamic reading from three uh, wonderful writers who have been students here at the University of Alberta, that's taking place on January 27th. And Megan has just posted a link if you would like to register for that. So Jamoke, we're really looking forward to to that and and I just want to thank you both so much um if Oma, it's it's always it's just so great to get to know more and more of your work this year and thank you both for the conversation and thanks to uh all of the audience members for for listening and for your comments and for for your questions on the 3rd of February we have um uh, a recital to mark the Black History Month in Canada on the 3rd of February. We're gonna have some African disciples recite the poems of African masters, you know, to mark the Black History Month next month. So of course the papers will be coming up, but I thought I should just let you know. So Jumoke herself will be reciting one of her African poets. So, more information on our website. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So do do check. Is that information on the, the writer in residence website? Yes, I believe by today, tomorrow it will be there. Well, thank you again, everybody, and have a, have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone. everyone. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Thank Thanks you, Sarah. Everyone. Thank, you so much. thank you, Sarah. Thank, thank you, everyone, you. for joining us. Bye. Thank you. Bye.